Our next um, presentation will be by David Kramer. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, have him as part of our program. Uh, David, uh, as you may well know, is currently uh, at the McCain Institute. Uh, he was formerly uh, worked in the State Department in the Department uh, in the um, Bureau. Bureau of uh, um, Democracy and uh, Human Rights. Uh, he's had a uh, long tenure as the director of Freedom House, the great uh, 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 NGO that publishes uh, Freedom in the World the rankings uh, of countries with regard to their uh, democratic and civil uh, liberties. Uh, and uh, the topic of your, well, I'll let, I'll let him introduce his own topic. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. And it's a real honor and privilege for me to be here. Uh, with you and, and Stanford, its program, the Leadership Academy, and Nino, of course. Uh, and it's, it's great to be back here in Georgia and to see some of you who, whom I have met before. And I appreciate the opportunity to return here. Uh, I'm, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm, I'm more of a policy walk, as we call them in Washington. And I'm one of those people who has gone through the revolving door which is to say I've worked in the government, I've worked in the NGO world. Uh, my experience, however, in the private sector is incredibly limited. And it was uh, a failure, to be perfectly honest. In 1989, uh, as the Berlin Wall was coming down and the revolutionary movements were spreading throughout East and Central Europe, I decided to launch a consulting company. Um, with some people up at Harvard, including uh, one of my brothers. And by the way, some advice, never go into business with a member of your family if you can avoid it. Um, and we decided we would offer expertise and advice on what to do in light of, of these movements. And um, obviously, if it had succeeded, I wouldn't be standing here. Um, and so since it didn't do very well, I decided to move to Washington. And I was in the think tank world for a number of years in Washington in the 1990s at CSIS and the Carnegie Endowment uh, before I, I entered the government and I served all eight years in the Bush administration. And I, I held uh, various jobs there, including being the Deputy Assistant Secretary responsible for Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova from 2005 to early 2008. And then, as, as Frank said, I became the Assistant Secretary responsible for the Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And I have to say that the experience of going into the government gave me a much greater appreciation of how difficult it is to formulate policy to make decisions in the government. When I was in the think tank world in the 1990s, I rather freely and carelessly would criticize the Clinton administration for various decisions and policies without having any understanding whatsoever of how policy is actually made, of what goes through the bureaucratic process of, of coming to decisions, making recommendations. And so uh, the revolving door that Washington has is not common in, in many countries, but I think it's, it's a tremendous feature because it injects new blood, new thinking, not only into the government, but actually when I left government and went back to uh, German Marshall Fund, Freedom House, and now McCain Institute, a much greater appreciation for how difficult it can be to, to make uh, policy to come up with decision-making options. Um, and I say that because it does take is, is Ambassador Kelly said, is, 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 I think it's indicated, the government, it takes the private sector, and it takes the civil society, it takes the nonprofit world, to really try to formulate the best options for decision makers to make the final decisions. And so what I want to focus on now is a little more of the experience trying to promote advanced democracy and my comments pick up rather well from the last question that was asked about the correlation between <coughs> democratic governance and uh, good governance and, and issues of corruption. And I go back to uh, a quote from President Ronald Reagan, Frank, 
uh, referred to him earlier for his comments, from June 8, 1982, in a speech before the British Parliament, in which he said, we must be staunch in our conviction that freedom is not the sole prerogative of a lucky few, but the inalienable right of all human beings. And a short year later, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy was launched in 1983, and Frank is a board member of the NED, uh, as well as its related organizations, that, uh, two of which I think perhaps are uh, better known than the other two, the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute. But just as important were the creation of these other two, the Solidarity Center, whose focus is on labor rights and workers' uh, rights, throughout the world, but also CITE, the Center for International Private Enterprise. CITE was founded with the following mission, to uh, promote private enterprise and market reform, to foster institutions necessary to establish and sustain market-oriented democracies, to increase <coughs> private sector participation in the democratic process. It also seeks to increase support for freedoms, rights, uh, and uh, other essentials for market-oriented democracy among government officials, among business people, among media, among the general public. Transparency and accountability are part of its mission. Voluntary business associations, all of these elements are part of SIPE's mission. And I emphasize SIPE in particular because of the theme of this conference, that the role of the private sector working together with government, working together with the nonprofit community, the civil society community, all of these elements come together under the NED family in the United States with these four organizations. And NED itself, of course, is, is a prominent uh, supporter and funder uh, of, of programs advancing democracy and, and freedom and human rights around the world. SITE tries to promote an entrepreneurial culture. It emphasizes the importance of access to information. And at its root, it supports rule of law and market-oriented democracies. And, and these are incredibly important. This is, again, where the private sector and democracy promotion organizations come together. Because the best kind of trade, the best kind of conditions for foreign direct investment are done in societies where there is rule of law, where there is recourse to courts and a judicial system should a party feel that it has been, its rights have been violated. So all the elements of democratic societies are extremely important to the private sector. And that's why the private sector needs to play an important role in advancing freedom and rule of law, transparency, all the elements of, of democracy. It uh, seeks a better investment climate, which you find again, where there is not guarantees of making a profit. No one can guarantee making a profit, but you should at least be assured of having the recourse should things not go in a proper fashion. Property rights, critically important, which can come only rooted in rule of law. All of these things are fundamental to development of a country's economy, of a private sector, which are critically important for a democracy to deliver. Because you can have the most legitimately elected new government in a country, but if it is not able to deliver economically by providing the conditions for investment, for private activity, for not just inventions, but innovation. Those things are critically important for any country's survival. Uh, and they are where the intersection comes between private sector and democracy uh, organizations. Private sector has a keen interest in development of democracy and human rights for the reasons I've mentioned, as well as for issues of transparency, where you remove these opaque layers that hide who may be behind certain purchases, certain assets, certain decision making. Rule of law is, is fundamental to all of this. Then you have the NGO sector. 
the sector that I'm much more familiar with, that I've been involved in both analytically and as a practitioner with Freedom House, does analysis, it does advocacy, and it does programming. And it's the NGO community that carries out much of the work that's funded by the U.S. government as well as private foundations, in some cases corporations. Um, and the NGO community is, is the part that tries to raise the issues of civil liberties, of rule of law, development of political parties, of free and fair elections. And all of these issues are fundamental to the development of democratic society. The NGO community, in addition to implementing these kinds of programs, can also act as a conscience, as, as a reminder, in some cases as a nuisance to, to governments, to remind them of their role in advancing a democratic direction, but also to the business community to remind them that there are certain obligations that the business community has. Not doing business with certain governments because, for example, of sanctions, and I'm going to come back to the issue of, issue of sanctions later. The third actor, private sector, NGO world, third actor is, of course, the government itself. And the US government is the largest funder of democracy and human rights work uh, in the world. The European Union together also is a major funder of these activities. It's a funder, it's a leader, it's a model, and in some cases it's a model that strays, that backtracks. And we've seen this in some countries that we thought had already cleared the hurdles and were moving in a democratic direction, but we're reminded that the democratic path is not linear. Just in the past uh, few months, we've heard serious concerns raised about uh, the following the elections in Poland, the Law and Justice Party, and certain acts that have been carried out by the new government involving the Constitutional Court or control over the public broadcaster. Poland, of course, has been one of the models in the European region for transition from communism to democracy, and has not only been a model in its own right, but has been an outspoken advocate for other countries in the region. Many people have compared Ukraine and Poland during their transitions, where Poland over the years has made significant progress and Ukraine has not made as much. But now there's concern that we're seeing some rollback in Poland moving more toward Ukraine rather than Ukraine moving toward Poland, and that is cause for concern. So governments have a critical role to play not just in their own right in terms of forming democratic systems of government and becoming models, but in advocating these kinds of opportunities for other societies. The United States, of course, was founded on the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Americans have believed that over the years, it is in our interest to try to advance these principles elsewhere around the world. It's not simply out of altruism that we try to promote and advance democracy and human rights. It is in our interest. And in fact, I reject the notion that we either advance our values, perhaps better described as universal values, or we advance our interests. My view is that we, in fact, enhance our interests by seeing universal values adhere to around the world. We, we have much better relations with fellow democracies, with societies that respect human rights, governments that are transparent, rooted in rule of law. Whereas we have a lot more challenges and problems and difficulties with authoritarian systems of government that don't respect their population's human rights, that engage in gross human rights abuses, that are rooted in corruption, in the conversation in the session before about Russia, whether it's more corrupt or more authoritarian, which is the bigger problem. I would actually argue that they, they are almost linked, inextricably linked. The more corrupt the regime becomes, the more authoritarian it becomes, because it then takes every measure possible to ensure that it doesn't lose the assets it has stolen. And you saw in the early Putin years, the takeover of nationwide TV, the 
channels previously owned by Kuczynski and Berezovsky, which have enabled Putin to create an environment in which he can present his case, but no one else can present an alternative view. And at the same time, depending on this, the numbers you believe, the reports, the scale of corruption in Russia and by Putin himself are astronomical. There was a New York Times report uh, back, uh, I think, about two years ago that described Putin's wealth referring to a CIA survey that had been done in 2007 on the amount of $40 billion. Now, this is also the same amount that Stanislav Belkovsky had been talking about for several years. Um, but having seen the report, that sounds about right to me. Uh, but that, that's a dated number. It's gone up. And so these issues of corruption and authoritarianism go together. And they pose a threat, not just to Russians, but beyond Russian borders. It is in our interest, as I said, to advance democracy, respect for human rights around the world. We wind up with uh, more reliable partners, not just in security terms, but in economic and trade terms. Are, are more stable, reliable partners for trade and investment that come from democracies. There are some fundamental features of democracy that I think are important that are in the interest of the private sector, of course, in the interest of the NGO world, uh, and in the interest of fellow democracies. Rule of law and accountability. Rule of law is fundamental. Accountability is about justice. Second is separation of powers with an independent judiciary and checks and balances. <coughs> Third is free and fair and competitive elections along with political party development. <coughs> Fourth is respect for women's rights and minority rights along with religious belief a diverse and independent media, including on the internet, both traditional and newer media, vibrant civil society, functional rep uh, and representative institutions, the issue of good governance, the effectiveness of governance that we were describing earlier, and protection of property rights to provide the basis for economic development and growth. How a regime and a government treat their own people is often indicative of how they behave in foreign policy. And so we shouldn't be surprised that in light of the worst crackdown in Russia since the break of the Soviet Union on human rights, that we see Putin act out against neighbors, including, of course, this country in 2008. Ukraine in 2014 and still ongoing. Support for Assad in Syria, a like minded leader, I would argue, uh, or threatening use of nuclear weapons. It's this kind of muscle flexing that's important to authoritarian leaders that poses a threat and a challenge, not just to <coughs> other governments, but to individuals from democratic societies to the point where businessmen in some cases, or NGO representatives either get denied entry into Russia and similar kinds of countries, or get harassed, beaten up, or in worst cases, get killed. China, where we've seen uh, also a, a crackdown that we haven't seen in many years against bloggers and lawyers and activists under President Xi, it has become a much more authoritarian regime, trying to keep a lid on things. And again, we see China flexing its muscles in the South China Sea. In Iran, where the number of executions continues to be sky high, the, the mullah is largely in charge of the system, uh, and Iran's support for Assad and for terrorism. In North Korea, of course, reminding us with the recent missile test or whatever it was, uh, arguably the most abusive regime in the world. 
So the way these regimes treat their own people is often indicative of how they will behave in foreign policy. And it is with these regimes that we face the greatest threats, the, the greatest challenges. And, and it gets at the issue of internal dynamics of the country do matter because they are likely to affect the way a country behaves in foreign policy terms. With democracies, we don't go to war with each other. We don't proliferate nuclear weapons. We tend not to be the source of, of terrorists and extremists. Democratization helps produce international peace and stability, as well as market liberalization and openness to trade and investment. This means that it is in everyone's interest, private sector, civil society, governments, to do everything possible to advance the cause of democracy and human rights around the world. It's important to support democracy advocates, human rights activists, civil society representatives, the flow of information. All these things are critically important, and these are the function of both government and the private sector and civil society working together helping these people morally, politically, in many cases financially. In a number of situations, NGOs and activists would go out of business if it weren't for the support from outside their country. And this is why you see, largely through phony legislative efforts, attempts to make illegal foreign assistance or to brand it with foreign agent labels for those recipients of outside funding. And this is an attempt by the authoritarian states to push back on efforts by the democratic community of nations to try to support and fund human rights and democratic activities around the world. And this is a challenge. It's part of the authoritarian challenge that Freedom House, my former organization, has described uh, in great detail. There is no cookie-cutter approach, of course, to promoting democracy and human rights around the world. Each country is unique. Each country has its own culture and history and traditions. And the, the goal should not be imposition of democracy from the United States or from anywhere else. The war in Iraq in 2003 did damage to this cause. There's no question about it. And in fact, Barack Obama five days before his inauguration in January 2009, gave an interview to the Washington Post in which he said we can't impose democracy through the barrel of a gun. I, I agree. The war in Iraq, I think, has unfortunately significantly tainted democracy promotion, the freedom agenda, as George W. Bush described it, to the point where the current Obama administration has rather distanced itself from democracy promotion, from the freedom of China. But the war in Iraq, I would argue, was an exception. In, in the vast majority of cases, the United States does not seek to impose either its way or a democratic way that isn't necessarily following an American model. But it is instead responding to local indigenous demand and desire for support for democracy and human rights. In the vast majority of cases with programming, through the net, through Freedom House, through other organizations, it is local individuals and organizations that seek the funding and support from the NED and from others. It's not where the NED comes running in, unwelcome, uninvited. It may not be so welcome from the government, but it's certainly asked to come in from local representatives. And, and so the point is that we're not trying to impose our way. What we are trying to do is to give people the opportunity, to give them the voice, the choice, to live in a more democratic society. And this is something, again, that is in the interest of the private sector, civil society, and the government worlds. There's the issue that some people raise that we're interfering in another country's internal affairs. In fact, I would argue that it is not interference, it is our business. 
particularly when countries commit themselves, governments commit themselves, to international commitments in which fundamental freedoms are codified. And so we have an obligation to ensure that these governments, that these countries, abide by the norms, by these standards, by these commitments that they themselves have made. For if we don't, then we undermine the integrity of these organizations. In this region, of course, I'm talking about the OSCE, but there's a Universal Declaration of Human Rights that virtually every country has signed up to. And so we do have an obligation to press governments and countries that stray from the commitments that they have made. We cannot remain silent when peaceful political activity is either crushed or made illegal or threatened, harassed, intimidated. I would argue that those of us who live in democratic societies have an obligation to give voice to those that are trying to be silenced. And it is in our interest, it also upholds our values. But supporting democratic forces is only part of the challenge, I would argue. It's a critical part of the challenge, but it's only part. And this is where uh, I w I'm going to get into something that is the source of a little more controversy, and it's the issue of sanctions. I would argue there needs to be a pushback against authoritarian regimes. There needs to be a price, a penalty, incurred consequences for engaging in gross human rights abuses. Without that, there really is no incentive for authoritarian regimes to change the way they behave. If they can get away with gross human rights abuses without paying any price, why should they change? If business is conducted as usual with these countries, with these societies, with these regimes, then it seems like they are, in fact, not paying any price, they can get away with this. In the past decade or so, there's been a new approach to trying to target sanctions against some of the worst human rights abuses. I was involved in the case of 2006 with Belarus. Belarus turns out to be a fairly easy case. There aren't a lot of business interests that were arguing in the United States, please don't sanction the Lukashenko regime. There's very little trade between the United States and Belarus. In Lithuania, in Poland, there actually were business associations who were arguing against sanctions against the Lukashenko regime. But the United States and the EU together did move ahead and sanction the Lukashenko regime starting in 2006. The United States ramped up those sanctions in 2007 as political prisoners remained in jail. <clears throat> and with that ramping up of sanctions, we saw two months later political prisoners starting to be released in Belarus. Belarus was the easy case. There were a few American companies, particularly involved in, in, fer in the fertilizer industry, Belarus is an exporter of that, that didn't want to see sanctions imposed. But they were quickly drowned out. There was support from the Congress for the sanctions, and there was actually strong support within the Bush administration to sanction the Lukashenko regime. Getting the EU on board was more difficult because of the proximity of certain countries to Belarus. But we managed to do that as well. And as you know, more recently, after a terrible crackdown in 2010 in Belarus where sanctions were reimposed, sanctions have been temporarily suspended in Belarus by both the United States and the EU and will likely stay, uh, stay lifted. The two tougher cases where the private sector and the civil society and the government have kind of clashed involve Russia. And these are sanctions that involve the Sergei Magnitsky Rule of Law and Accountability Act and then the sanctions involving the invasion of Ukraine. In, I think most of you are familiar with the case of Sergei Magnitsky, a lawyer who had been working for Hermitage Capital who uncovered a $230 million fraud by 
Russian government officials, in particular in the Ministry of Interior. He was in turn arrested and charged with the very fraud he uh, disclosed uh, and kept in jail for nearly a year until he was uh, beaten, deprived medical treatment, and died in prison. It, the, his uh, client, Bill Browder, the head of Hermitage Capital, uh, who had been one of Putin's biggest cheerleaders, one of the biggest foreign direct investors in Russia. Then, after having been expelled from Russia in 2005, took on the Magnitsky case and was determined to seek justice for Magnitsky, where he realized it was not going to happen inside Russia, so he sought a form of justice outside of Russia. He came to the United States, pushed for targeted sanctions against, there were 60 people initially listed involved in the Magnitsky case and wanted to have a visa ban and asset freeze imposed on them. I got involved in this, this matter when I was the president of Freedom House. I have no illusions about Bill Browder, uh, a man born in the United States who gave up his US citizenship to live in the UK, became a citizen there for tax reasons. As I said, he was one of the biggest cheerleaders of Putin when he was doing well in Russia. And he turned, but he adopted what I thought was a worthy cause. And that's why I got behind the cause and got involved in it. And so there was a push starting in the spring of 2010 that took two and a half years till passage of the Magnitsky Act that sought to put, uh, bring about a sense of justice for the murder of Magnitsky by going after individual Russian officials involved in his case, not against the country. And you had a number of Russian liberals and opposition figures arguing in favor of the Magnitsky Act. In their view, it was not anti-Russian. It was actually helping Russia by being targeted, by not being against the country, but by going after officials who were directly involved in gross human rights abuses. And so with huge bipartisan majorities in both the House of Representatives and the US Senate, the legislation was passed. The Obama administration, President Obama signed it. They were opposed to it initially. Uh, and it became law. The American business community, the community that does business in Russia, was firmly opposed to the Magnitsky legislation. It argued that passing this legislation would harm US companies' interests in Russia. And so what we, those of us who advocated for passage of Magnitsky decided to do was to link it to something that was of interest to the business community. And that was passage of the Jackson-Vanek Amendment. Jackson-Vanek was passed in 1974 in the Soviet Union to try to lift the, the hold on emigration of Soviet Jews in particular, though it wasn't specific to Soviet Jews. It was a piece of legislation that has been on the books in the US Congress for almost four decades. But with Russia's entry into the WTO, the United States actually had an interest in lifting Jackson Bannock to give Russia a uh, permanent normal trade relations status. Otherwise, it would actually hurt American businesses operating in Russia. And so we decided to link the lifting of Jackson Bannock to give Russia that status by replacing Jackson Bannock with Magnitsky. You have to remember this was happening in 2012. <laughs> when Putin had returned to the presidency and the real crackdown inside Russia was picking up momentum. And so the business community actually didn't have an argument anymore against this. The business community in the United States had to get behind this because they wanted Jackson Manick lifted, but they also knew that it wouldn't be lifted. Congress was opposed to simply lifting Jackson Manick without replacing it with the Magnitsky Act. And that's how the Magnitsky Act became legislation. Its implementation, to my regret, has been rather minimal. There are only about 35 Russian officials on the Magnitsky list since it was enacted in 2012. But there are some important senior Russian officials on a classified version of the list. These names have leaked out. 
but they include Ramzan Kadyrov, the leader of Chechnya, Mr. Bastrykin, the head of the investigative committee. And denying Russian officials the opportunity to stash the ill-gotten gains in the West, in the United States, denying them and their families the opportunity to travel to the United States, may not bring about a, a halt to human rights abuses in Russia, but it may act as a deterrent to future abuses. And at least it imposes some justice for those abuses that have been committed. The second set of sanctions involving Russia have also been controversial in the American business community and those involve Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Starting with the illegal annexation of Crimea, continuing with the aggression into the Donbass region. Here too, the American business community has argued against sanctions. These sanctions have been similar to Magnitsky in that they have targeted individuals linked to the invasion of Ukraine and close to Putin, but they've also been broader in nature. They've denied refinancing, for example, for Russian banks. They've, they've closed off business opportunities, particularly in oil and gas exploration. And so the business community in the United States has been strongly against these sanctions. And yet, it became an overwhelming case, including, again, huge bipartisan support in the US Congress, that sanctions had to be implemented against Russia for its violation of numerous international norms and standards by invading Ukraine. And so despite the objections of the business community, these sanctions have been imposed. The American business community worried that the United States would impose these sanctions unilaterally, and that has not been the case. The US and the EU together, along with Canada, Australia, other countries, have imposed these sanctions. The sanctions, I would argue, have had an impact. The price of oil, the drop in the price of oil, of course, has had an even bigger impact on the Russian economy. But the sanctions have not been insignificant. And what the American business community was never able to answer is, if not sanctions, what should we do? How should we express our outrage toward Russia's violation of numerous international norms and standards? its invasion of a neighbor, its illegal annexation of Crimea, the first since World War II, by the way, of one European country of another. Short of going to war, what is it that the United States should do? How should we respond? And the business community never had an answer. So these kinds of sanctions have been a fairly new development. They're, they're, they're targeted for the most part, they've been ramped up on occasion, and I would argue they've been effective. They are not going to turn an authoritarian regime into a democracy. But the point of them is to impose costs and consequences on gross rights abusers, on those who would invade another country. And it tries to bring about some sense of justice in the case of Sergei Magnitsky. It is an example where private sector has gone off on one direction and the government and civil society have gone in a different direction. But at the end of the day, I would argue that these sanctions will create the foundation for a much better environment for businesses to operate in, in Russia, in Ukraine, anywhere else. And so it, it is, I would argue, the cause of supporting democracy is not only the right thing to do, but it makes sense from an economic perspective, a business perspective, and just as importantly, a national security perspective. These things are not inseparable. They all go together. So it's not a choice of one or the other. It's in fact moving forward on all these fronts. So let me stop there and happy to take any questions or comments. I highly respect your point of view and 
But at the same time, excuse me to talk about politics here also because uh, political and economical interest is highly involved in all the decisions. This is why we see, and I'm not accusing, but we see on a pragmatic level that the United States or any other country, democratic country, and once this is changing, they will change the side of their support using all these uh, uh, communication tools and argumentations. So the international opinion of specifically people who are living in a very undeveloped countries and they are trying to play this game of uh, defending human rights, uh, 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 controlling uh, or uh, fighting corruption, etc. They find themselves alone and once they are back or backed by United States who are accused by dict dictators and at the end, if the United States or the West have uh, economical interest with the adversary, they will choose the, the other world and we are left alone. So, how can we deal with schizophrenia and knowing that it's real politics and this is what guides the world, unfortunately. Your, your point is absolutely right. It's, it's foolish and wrong, in my view, for the United States to argue that we don't have double standards. We do. And, and I'll be more specific uh, in response to your comment. Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, where the United States for years, Republican or Democratic administrations, has said nothing. And then we discover with the execution of the cleric that things might be getting a little unstable. George Borsch started the conversation by saying that we thought we were getting security and stability in the Middle East by ignoring authoritarianism when in fact we were not getting either security or stability. He didn't do much about it, but he started the debate and conversation in the United States. We've seen, I would say, since the movements in 2011, real difficulty in the United States to come to grips with what's happened. If you look at Egypt, for example, where we debated whether to urge Mubarak to step down. And then in 2013, we refused to call what was clearly a coup, a coup. We engaged in all these rhetorical gymnastics to avoid using the term. Um, the Middle East, I think you're right, is the region where we are most guilty of double standards, either for energy reasons and economic reasons or security reasons. Uh, peace treaty with Israel, for example, in the case of Egypt. Um, China is another one where, for the most part, the United States has not pushed very much on Chinese human rights abuses. Our economic relationship with China is considerable, and there has been a view that if we press the Chinese too much, we will adversely affect the trade and economic relationship we have. My counter to that is that China owns quite a bit of our debt, not because it's a nice country, but because it views it as a good investment. And so if the United States were to ramp up criticism of Chinese human rights abuses, China's not going to dump uh, the, the debt that it owns. Um, I, I think we exaggerate the blowback, potential blowback, from other countries if we speak out more about abuses in the Saudi Arabia's, Egypt's, China's, and elsewhere. We always speak out against the easy countries with whom we don't have other interests, North Korea. Cuba it had been for years, until the, the normalization there. Um, and, and so, it, at the end of the day, we are guilty of double standards. You're absolutely right. I would pick up on the metaphor that Ambassador Kelly referred to, the stool. In, in US foreign policy, there's a three-legged stool of economic interests, economic and energy interests, 
uh, national security interests, but then there is also democracy, human rights interests. And all too often, that third leg, democracy, human rights interests, has been shortchanged in many relationships with other countries. I would argue that a three-legged stool with one leg short like that is unstable. It's not a good relationship to have. It's not to argue that democracy and human rights should trump those other interests, but it's to argue that democracy and human rights deserves roughly equal attention as those other interests. And all too often the United States has not done that. So, so we need to acknowledge the dou double standards um, and do a better job of trying to address it. Because at the end of the day, we, we run the risk of being associated with authoritarian regimes that might suddenly be out of power. It, it's still, when I think back on 2011, I'm still struck at how the United States had nothing to do with what happened there but it could easily have had something to do because we supported many of those regimes. Um, and yet, it was, a, it was indigenous movements that brought about change there. And uh, we did the right thing in Libya, for example, by intervening in Benghazi. And then we completely washed our hands of Libya and left it alone, and now, unfortunately, the country is a bit of a mess. Um, so I, I, I do worry that by not taking the right positions, we actually are also hurting our interests. Uh, and, and so we need to do a better job of fixing these, these double standards. I think, yeah, Dennis. Uh, maybe I can develop the question. How uh, do you think uh, universal is this application of democracy and so on? If when uh, the compromise uh, quite often comes from the United States, for example, in the Russia's case, uh, with, uh, well, to give an example, Radio Liberty, some NGOs like Canon Institution, with uh, So it came from, from Washington, I mean, those decisions. And, uh, and then people on the ground feel very uh, confused about it. And another case is when you look at the United States with the uh, uh, United Kingdom, when, uh, when Cameron is one of the most fierce fighters of Putin, and at the same time, they all kind of oligarchs just buying uh, all these houses in London, and uh, just common people, common researchers can get visa to go to, <laughs> to the UK just to, uh, to research and so on, because they do not have uh, 1,000 uh, pounds on their bank account. So how can you comment on this? Well, on, on the decisions by organizations like RFERL and Kennan, RFERL still has some functioning in Russia, as far as I understand, but, right, right. I, I, the, the, the challenge is what I would call unilateral disarmament, where we decide preemptively to close. I, I think in 2012, it was, I believe, we announced, the U.S. government announced that the U.S. Agency for International Development was being closed. We announced a Russian government decision. We made it easy for the Russians, and we didn't push back on that decision. I, I, I was at Freedom House at the time. I was invited to a briefing by government officials, and I was furious because we were making it easy for the Russians to kick us out. It's hard to stay until you really get ejected from a country. I think it's actually really important to do because it is harder for a government to actually take that step and eject an American organization or American entity like RFERL. Um, but if we do it ourselves, if we surrender, more or less, we're making their job much easier. So um, I, I wish that it's easy to say sitting in the comfort of Washington. I mean, I criticize the Putin regime, as you know, all the time. I don't go to Russia anymore. I do it from the comfort and safety of DC. But for organizations that are there, you have to try to get through difficult times too, it, it, and as challenging as that is. In terms of the UK, the United States is guilty of this as well, where uh, Russian oligarchs buy up assets in Miami, New York. Uh, I, I saw, I think I mentioned it, Catherine, uh, the, there was a story in the 
uh, New York Times, I believe, that the FBI is now going to be investigating high-end real estate purchases. This is something that should have been done a long time ago, to find out where the money comes from for these assets. Um, and so UK needs to do the same thing. There was this film, of course, that exposed the corruption in the London real estate market. Uh, about uh, a fake real estate agent going around saying that he had this dirty money from Russian ministers who wanted to invest, and most of the real estate agents in London were all too eager to take it. So it, it, you're getting at something which is, it's also about us. We have to clean up our own systems and prevent what I would argue is one of Putin's greatest exports, that's corruption. To export it, we also have to import it. So we need to do a much better job of cleaning up our, our real estate markets, our financial systems. Uh, we need to do a better job of saying that actually it's not okay to take $10 million to fund a political party in France. That that should be outrageous and unacceptable. And yet Mar Marine Le Pen goes around bragging about it. Um, for Silvio Berlusconi to go visit his buddy whenever he can. The Czech president. To, to go and buddy up to Putin. These things should be exposed, um, and yet the, the uh, systems and, and societies get away with it. We're running out of time, I think. Maybe, yeah, maybe one quick question. Okay. Thanks. Um, I would like to uh, what's your opinion about uh, the international development and the reform of the international development overall reform? Because it's not a secret that uh, the international development models uh, as well as the many international development agencies have been criticized uh, in, in being not effective and the model of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the conditionalities, well, didn't really work well in many countries. And uh, on top of that, uh, given the um, uh, invasion in, in Georgia in 2008, uh, and uh, actually 2008, when many of the glad think tanks were writing that Ukraine will be next, um, Carnegie Endowment for Democracy, Washington was uh, all that, all were saying that we are all Ukrainians now, it was back in 2008. Uh, the same as the annexation of Crimea, there were reports by think tanks, but this knowledge has not been utilized. And again, was the new way of criticism for these policies to be reactive, including from the United States, but also the EU, uh, as opposed to being proactive. So I would be really keen to learn your views of how we change the paradigm from the reactions of Minsky Act, you know, sanctions, uh, to the paradigm of being more proactive in addressing these forthcoming challenges. Look, I agree 100%. We have been reactive to Putin's taking, seizing the agenda rather than being pre proactive or preemptive. And it allows him to set the agenda. We respond. He's always one step ahead. It doesn't mean, by the way, that he's necessarily winning. But he is in the short term by forcing us to be in the response mode. I, 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 I think there are a few things we can do. I think. Um, we can get much more aggressive in launching corruption investigations. The FIFA scandal is fantastic. It has people in the Kremlin very nervous. Anything that makes the Kremlin nervous, in my view, is a good thing. We should look at the International uh, Olympic Committee, um, which, you know, remember the Sochi Olympics. Um, and all of these things, I think, I, I would widen the sanctions. I would look at SWIFT, though SWIFT I don't think will happen, the SWIFT banking system, because the United States can't do that on its own. It would require the Europeans. Um, and uh, I, I think beefing up the defenses of the neighbors. I, I think the biggest mistake President Obama made in handling the Ukraine crisis was denying Ukraine lethal military assistance. This is a controversial issue. There, there are many very uh, well-respected people in my country who agree with the president. But the U.S. Congress, by huge bipartisan majorities, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Vice President, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Supreme Allied Commander, all supported providing your country with lethal military assistance. The one person who disagreed happened to be the most powerful person in the U.S., the President of the United States. I think it was a terrible decision. Um, and I think it was a terrible decision because of the Budapest Memorandum of 1994 and for many other reasons. If we don't stand up to Putin's bullying and aggression, 
then he'll just keep doing it. And the United States, I would argue, has an extra obligation to lead the way through NATO, through other allies, um, and through support, including providing better uh, defense for Georgia, should there be renewed aggression against this country. And there, there's always the creeping annexation problem of the demarcation line being moved. So I, I agree with you that we need to be much more proactive than we've been, um, because otherwise they'll, they'll, we'll be dealing with the next crisis, the next emergency that Putin has created, uh, rather than trying to preempt them. All right, thank you. Right, thank you very much.